Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, sometimes you just have to tear into the spectacle of it all, and if uh, you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and uh, I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and uh, pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming you do because you're listening right now, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. Also, we'd love it if you'd follow us on social media. You can find us on the Facebook, the Instagram, and the Twitter at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally... And I say this a lot, but it's true. It's most important. Please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, entertainment at large. Because if we're writing about it and talking about it, we love it when you come and read about it. So please stop on by. On this episode, after a uh, after a bit of a hiatus, uh, not intentional, but it was a hiatus none the same. Uh, on this episode, we have got a big one. We've got the one and only Mr. Todd McFarland. And if you don't know who that is, that is a, uh, well, he is a uh, comic book artist and general pop culture figure of note who uh, really set the ball rolling on Venom. And uh, we talk with him about uh, the release of Venom, Let There Be Carnage on 4K Blu-ray and DVD, and we just talked to him about sort of the origins of the character. We talked with him about uh, how the MCU has evolved and sort of how they're putting all these stories onto the big screen for all of us to enjoy and just sort of the nature of the Beast as a whole. And, I mean, just what Marvel did with the character and what he had the opportunity to do with the character back in the day and... uh, so very much more. We had a we had a great talk with Todd, and uh, I certainly hope you enjoy it, uh, either before or during or after you go pick up uh, Venom: Let There Be Carnage, which is available on 4K, uh, DVD, Blu-ray, and digital right now. But uh, enjoy our talk with Todd McFarlane because it's a fun one. Now, I mean, obviously, I guess my first question is because I mean, obviously. You didn't create the Venom character, but you drew the Venom character. And I'm kind of curious to hear how this character no, no, was no, no, no. So, so you let's clear, no, no, no. We, Spider-Man. We, 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 didn't, we didn't create the, the black and white costume. We created the Venom character. Okay. So tell me how this pit, how, tell me sort of the birth of the character then. Yeah. So there was a black costume, right? That, that, but there wasn't no Venom, right? So the, 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 the legal terminology is you know the the personas that you create for these characters right so, right um the but the the quick story i've told plenty of times is that um peter parker when i got to the spider-man office the spider-man books had them all dressed in black which was a remnant of this big event book called uh, secret wars that's right yeah uh, which is where the black and white costume came from from the mind of a, I think a 12 year old contestant uh, or a 10 year old or something. It was like some, some, some young kid that was that won the contest to come up with a new Spidey costume. Um, but he put the, you know, they were, cause the sales of Spider-Man were sort of lagging a little bit and they were looking for some sort of pop on it. And so by the time I got to the Spider-Man office coming off a run on the incredible Hulk, Spider-Man, Peter Parker was in the black costume and, and I wasn't, inclined nor interested in drawing spider-man with a black costume because to me it was like what that's that's not what my comic book collection looks like i'm a geek i'm still i'm still a kid at heart that's not what my pajamas look like man i need i need that i need that other costume so uh so we had a debate and i said i'll come draw spider-man but um we got to get rid of that costume i thought it was, it was that simple let's just get rid of the black costume put them in his old ones everybody's happy. Let's go. Uh, wasn't quite that simple. The people in upper management uh, who had something to do with the secret ward were like, no, we kind of like that black costume. So I had to go to plan B, which was, okay, well, let's just not just get rid of it. Let's just take it off Peter and put it on Paul, 
right? So we'll just take it from Peter, give it to Paul. Um, in this case, Eddie. Uh, and that was it. And, and, then, and then if I take it off Peter, the highlight of that move was that Peter Parker then would get his classic red and blue costume back. Right. And that's right. all I was going for. That's all that this was about. It was just a finesse to get Peter Parker into his red and blue costume because I was a geek and that's all I wanted to draw. The byproduct of me being dumb geeky kid was that we had to create this other character that ends up being this guy that you and I now know is Venom. Boom, right? So wish I could say that that little sort of mini power play where it's like, no, I'm not going to draw him unless we get rid of the costume. I wish I could say that I knew it was a billion dollar idea at the time, right? <laughs> so, because I would have negotiated my contract differently. Um, but uh, they agreed that we could just move it to another character. Um, they asked me if I'd be willing to hold off for a couple issues. I came on the Amazing Spider-Man 298. Could I hold off and, and we could do it as a bigger story in issue 300 because the anniversary story was coming up. And I was like, no, it wouldn't have been my choice, but yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Um, and so I, I, I grit my teeth during those first two issues, most of issue 300, in all, in all honesty. I was like, who cares about him in the black costume, <laughs> right? Like this is ridiculous. Um, but uh, I did the I did some sketches of what I thought the you know could look like, and the concept was it was a live costume. Hence, it was an alien. Hence, it was a monster. Monsters should be cool. Monsters are always big and gnarly with big teeth. So that was sort of the easy concept. Uh, I did my drawings. They liked the drawings, and they gave it to the writer David Michelini. And then he came back said he was going to make it Eddie Brock. Good thing they didn't tell me that in advance because I probably would have drawn more, a more humanoid version of it. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I probably would have added a little sexy to it, but it probably still would have been humanoid. But uh, it actually ended up working good that we sort of sort of did the visual first and, and, and David came up with all the cool stuff second uh, because it was all right, uh, I guess it's Eddie. It must, it's now going to have to swallow him or something because Eddie's kind of tiny compared to Venom. I drew Venom. He's pretty big. He's a big dude. Uh, and so just, you know, because the costume was alive, it was like, oh yeah, we can make it just sort of swallow him up uh, and all the other cool things. And, and that was it. And, and every time we brought Venom back, the fans just see, seemed to be a little more vo vocal about him. And they went, man, we like him. We like him. Now, again, he was a villain. Let's Again, let's yeah. be clear. Let's remind people. He was created first and foremost at the beginning as a venom. I mean, as a villain. Uh, and that's what he was. And then at that point, it was like, oh, I wonder if he could climb the rank and file and maybe get to be one of Spidey's, you know, bigger villains like the Green Goblin, right? Could he ever be like the Green Goblin? And then he sort of eventually got there and then it was like, man, maybe he could be like Dr. Doom and be a Marvel villain. Um, but he was so, so popular that, you know, all of a sudden then here comes the lethal protector and, uh, and, and they start converting him, you know, into more of a sort of an anti-hero at some point because they thought they'd get more value out of out of him uh, doing it that way. And obviously whatever they did and all the people along the way um, at both Marvel and Sony, they, you know, I tip my hat to all of them for keeping the brand, the character alive and relevant for 30 years. Now, it's not an easy task. I, I live it every day of my life. It is, it is a almost a near impossible task. And when people accomplish it, I'm, I, I admire it. So, how much of of Spawn is owed to Venom? Because it, in hindsight, they feel like they're distant cousins in many ways. Like there is a bit of a thread through there. They almost feel like they're related somehow. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, I created the look of Spawn when I was sixteen, right? Long, years and years and years and years before Venom. Um, so, you know, the 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 look was there. Um, the the costume sort of being alive and stuff in all honesty had nothing to do with uh venom it had to do with me being lazy um in that i drew the i i'm i'm, I'm notoriously horrible at referencing right yeah. there's a thing called the internet now and and people can do stuff but 
I'm, I'm terrible uh, to the point that I don't even reference my own work. And so what would happen? What would, what happened in the first couple issues? Uh, as I had uh, spawn, he had like spikes and he had like patches and things on him. He had sort of accessories. And I guess, unbeknownst to me, I was mixing and matching. They were moving right from the light, and I then get the mail, and they go, "Todd, how come his patch is on his left arm and now it's on his right arm?" You know, da, 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 da. and there's only look at. At that point, David, there's only two answers you give publicly. One, I'm a dumbass and I don't reference my own artwork, which is actually the truth. But you know what? Wasn't really a good answer at that point for me. So the other one was because the costume is alive. That's it. The costume is alive. That's it. Like Dr. Galakowicz in the, in the beer commercial. So yes, I am. Yes, I am. So um, that was it. It was like I was... I, I, I had to sort of come up with a plausible reason why I wasn't referencing my own work. And then it just became its own thing in the stories. I went, oh, first off, now I don't have to ever reference. I'm even telling my own artist now, forget what the guy looked like before all the costumes are alive. You can mess it up from panel to panel and it works. Uh, but it's now become some of the mythology on him that, that may have you know, that they both have sort of living costumes. Uh, okay, cool. So, but I know a lot of superheroes that fly. I don't know that that makes them sort of kissing cousins. But For for you, has it always feels like uh, any characters you've created, like in the comic books, it always feels like you've been very ahead of the curve and trying to get them on the screen. Like for you from day one, was that always the impetus when you got into the business just to try to evolve what you did on the comic book page to the screen? No, no, they, uh, the, the, uh, the creed when I was young is the same creed that I have today. Just make it cool shit. Just make it cool. If you do stuff that visually is appealing and then you can drop a story on top of it, you can sell it. You can sell it. You can sell it. How do I know? Ask people who did Matrix, right? Nobody saw that coming what bullet time what the heck is that man oh my gosh so you just add and do some things visually that people haven't seen before or they've seen it they've seen people dodging bullets they just didn't see them dodging it that way the way they did in matrix so if you can sort of create this sort of sexy version of what everybody's already seen what everybody sort of has in their mind they have their sort of status quo and you can do something outside the status quo, you will get giant points for it. How do I know? Because I've seen it. Steve Jobs did it. Took his phone and 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 basically went up on stage, sort of late in the game, and said, "I'm going to do a phone." Uh, Steve, lots of people have a phone. Yeah, but it's going to take pictures. Uh, they all take pictures, Steve. Yeah, but it's going to text. No, they do that too, Steve. And music, they do that. So you can tell that Steve. All of it, they can do it. It already is here. And then he, then he did it. But when they text and when they email, do they touch glass? You're touching plastic. You touch glass. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Steve Jobs was a genius. He didn't invent nothing. He just made it cooler. It's still a text. You're just touching glass. So what? That was it. I keep telling people, you come up with one add-on onto any idea and people will think that somehow you invented stuff. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, let's, let's go. So I just try to always just say what already exists in the world because it takes too much time and energy to and, you know, educate people to doing new stuff and nobody, nobody sort of, we don't, you can't create in a vacuum. The whole, your whole life is an experience is in your brain. Can you add one or two pieces to something that exists? And if you can, you can you can you can make a living out of that. And and sometimes you can make it a brand that people will go for. So that's it. So all the characters I ever designed, what I was doing with Spider-Man, all it was was just like, hey, what can I do to make this fun and cooler for people who haven't seen sort of a look? Let's just be fun. And by the way, I'm sitting in a room for 12 hours a day drawing by myself at that point not 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 really a very sociable activity 
So I got to entertain myself. And so it was like, oh man, I'm going to do Spider-Man looking like, like a bug and he's going to have all these new webs. And then he's going to go against Venom and Venom's going to be a monster. And he's going to have this big, this big giant mouth with all these teeth. And it's just, this is going to be, this is going to be super fun. <laughs> and, and I'm going to get through the day, even though it might be a 15 hour day. Right. I just have to mentally psych myself out. Luckily, my immaturity is somehow a common thing for a lot of people where there's a lot of geeks out there. We all sort of like the same thing. For sure. Yeah. So it, work, it works out OK. So I've been able to tap in the sort of average geekdom and there's a lot of us. Cool. Now, at the end of the day, what do you think of Tom's portrayal of Venom? It really feels like he's the perfect balance between sort of the villain and the sardonic protector good guy at the same time. I think um, I think uh, Tom Hardy is a skilled enough actor that you could probably put anything in the story and he would be able to get to it. Um, I've seen him. I've seen him do a wide range. I, I would I would completely say the same for Woody Harrelson. Yeah. Woody Harrelson has this amazing range of characters in his uh, literally on his resume already. Uh, so so uh, and and Tom Hardy. I don't know him. Never met him. Uh, strikes me as a, a guy who's very focused, competitive, if you will, mm -hmm. with with what he does. He wants to he wants to be as good as he can at any given moment, right? So, I, I mean, I'm a baseball guy. So every time I went up to the plate, my goal was to get a base hit. And even though I know you fail from time to time, there was never a time where I ever stepped up to the plate and said I wasn't going to get a base hit. Tom Tom strikes me as that kind of guy. He just wants to give everything he can into every one of his roles. So whatever you need out of it, he's going to try and give it to you. Whether you you know agree with every one of his choices and every one of his characters of every one of his movies, no actor is ever going to have that. Um, so do people like the Venom movie? That's there's I keep saying I keep coming back to the same thing, David. There's really only one question anybody ever has to ask when they're making any kind of entertainment, but especially in a in a movie. If I'm if I'm the head of Sony, if I'm if I'm the director producer of it, if I'm Marvel, whatever else, we can get into all the nuances. How did Tom do this? What did the special effects look like? Did Venom do this? Was Carnage mean enough? You know, but we can get into all that. There's only really one question. For your ten dollars, fifteen dollars, whatever it costs you to get into that dark room for two hours, and when you watch it, was it worth two hours? That's it. That's the only question. And if the answer is like, yeah, I enjoyed it, then that's the, everything else is a detailed argument. For sure. Right. So you just you go, I I kind of like that movie. And you can sit there now and say, not all of it, you know, or whatever. And you can start picking it apart, which we can with every movie, any piece of entertainment. Um, matter of fact, they call it uh uh you know, Monday quarterbacking, uh, uh when you watch sports, right? You just yeah, say, Man, yeah. I would have done this because we're all smarter than the coaches. For sure. Uh so we're all smarter than than the executives and the directors on every movie. Uh, but but the, the simple question is, who like regardless of whether it was completely faithful to the comics, regardless of whether it was completely faithful to this or that piece, whatever, given it's 30 years old and there's an amalgamation of people who've been dealing with it, did it entertain you? And if the answer is like, yeah, mission accomplished, mission accomplished. Everything else is a secondary conversation. All right, let's let's talk about a detail. Well, you know what? Venom still entertained us and thank you for still entertaining us and thank you for the time today man okay well I, I you 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 owe way more to to Marvel and and Sony than you do to me I just I just helped put one of the first footprints it's in there the ball rolling, people, my lots friend. of other people have put Somebody's a lot of other footprints on that journey you were that, you were that guy so again thanks for the time today I appreciate it all right David be good and don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.